Japan. And we thought what would be better than getting the experts from around the world to teach us about follicular lymphoma and also about what's going on in the field of cellular therapy, where we're hoping as radiation oncologists, we can play uh, an important role, hopefully, with the help of our medical oncologists. Uh, we are joined here by Dr. Nassipal, uh, uh, an expert in the CAR T cell space and follicular lymphoma. Uh, Dr. Nassipal is an associate professor at MD Anderson. She is well known for her work in follicular lymphoma uh, and uh, in the, the field of CAR T cell therapy by her seminal paper that was published recently in the Journal of Clinical Oncology. She is our uh, collaborator at MD Anderson, and we are uh, extremely uh, pleased every day to work with her. Uh, she values radiation oncology, and we are having a great uh, collaboration with her and our faculty. And we are also joined by Dr. Jill Saal from Memorial Sloan Kettering, the head of lymphoma there. Uh, no need for introduction. Uh, with his uh, long-standing leadership in uh, JELA and uh, many of the European oncology groups, also with many seminal uh, papers there. He would also uh, join team with Dr. Nestapel to uh, tell us about where we stand at this point with follicular lymphoma. Uh, so at the very end, Dr. Yahalom will give us a, a quick update on some of the research that we're thinking of doing and collaborating uh, with our colleagues from around the world. So that's what we're gonna end up with. Without further ado, I'm gonna give it to Dr. Nestapel to start. Thank you for joining us this morning. Thank you, I appreciate the kind introduction. And yes, I value your leadership, your mentorship, and I, it's truly a pleasure to work with you every day. So I'm gonna share my screen. Organize this a little bit. Okay, so you can see my slides okay? Yes. Okay. So when you asked me to cover the role of radiation, particularly as the treatment landscape is rapidly evolving in flicker lymphoma, I thought, let me think of a way to try and bring in these two modalities, specifically um, as we have a new drug approval with AxiCell in the management of relapsed refractory follicular lymphoma. So I'll cover some of the pivotal studies that have led to recent approval and anticipated approvals and how I see radiation playing a role. So these are my disclosures. I'm not going to go into much depth about the background of follicular lymphoma, um, but I do want to show you some recent data. So Anderson participates in an observational cohort called LEO, which is eight centers, primarily led by um, Mayo in Iowa. Um, and Dr. Jill Salas has participated in a number of um, important observations utilizing their data as validation cohorts for some of his work as well. But what we've done recently is to set out and describe what is the current benchmark for the relapsed follicular lymphoma setting. And so we pulled data from our centers, including the data that's been collected since 2015 forward, but also going backwards, because again, this is a disease that we currently tell patients they should be expecting at least 20 plus years of median overall survival from the time they're diagnosed. And so what this curve shows is the overall survival by lines of treatment. So I think there still is a misconception out there, mostly by some community oncologists, that this is a disease that is not worrisome to patients and that many of patients will die of other causes. Um, but again, Dr. Sauls has been pivotal in that, showing that no, most of these patients still die of their disease or treatment complications of their disease. And so we have to be mindful that this is something that will impact their lives over a 20 year span, uh, but nonetheless is important to consider. But we also have to be mindful of the toxicities of our treatment. And so what we set out to do is just look at the overall survival by line of therapy starting at third line, because we all know that the best outcomes are those seen uh, in the frontline setting. But outlined here by color, you can see third line, we're still looking at pretty reasonable overall survival. Uh, but many of these patients will experience multiple relapses, and we went as far out as nine plus lines of therapy given we had tracked some patients since 2002 forward. 
And you can see the overall survival gets dramatically shorter as patients start to experience multiple relapses, suggesting that we still need to focus efforts on finding effective therapies in the relapse setting that are also not gonna hinder survival as a result of causing unacceptable uh, toxicity. This is progression-free survival by line of therapy. And again, as I mentioned, the front line is where we're doing the best currently. Uh, second line, we're still doing reasonably well, but once we get to third line and later, those progression-free survival curves start to overlap and they're relatively short. Again, suggesting that maybe the greatest unmet need may be in third line and later lines of treatment, which is where most of the new drug approvals are currently uh, occurring. So let me talk about something that's been approved recently and others that are in the pipeline. So AxiCell is an autologous CAR T-cell therapy where we harvest patients' own T-cells. Uh, they're sent off to a central manufacturing site and using a retrovirus uh, that leads to expression of an external receptor targeting CD19. And it has a co-stimulatory domain of CD28, which leads to rapid cytokine production, rapid T-cell expansion, and a pretty marked area under the curve within the first two weeks, but then also pretty rapid trailing off of these CARs. Though there have been CARs detected in patients out to 12, 18 months, uh, again, the CD28 leads to most of the activity in the first two to four weeks of treatment, which has been debated. And I think maybe that debate is um, most pertinent in ALL and maybe in indolent lymphomas where this question about do you need rapid T-cell expansion and rapid tumor clearance or do you need persistence? And I think a disease like follicular lymphoma where we expect this disease to be present or recur over again, 20 to 30 years, maybe persistence matters. Either way, I'll show you data from Zuma 5 and I'll show you data from Alara, which is a CD, uh, I'm sorry, a 41BB co-stimulatory molecule, which has more of a blunted area of the curve, but more persistence. So the Zuma 5 study was a single arm phase two trial, uh, multi-center. They enrolled 146 patients, the vast majority of which were follic lymphoma, though there was a cohort of marginal zone lymphoma patients. You can see on this slide the key eligibility criteria. So they did enroll up to grade 3A follicular lymphoma who had had at least two prior lines of therapy. And that prior therapy must have included an alkylating agent and a CD20 antibody. The conditioning regimen is outlined below. Again, there are differences in the lymphocyte depleting chemotherapy utilized across some of these cellular therapy studies. Um, in my opinion, this is one of the more aggressive dosing outside of the allogeneic CAR setting, but 500 milligrams per meter squared of cytoxin on days um, minus five, minus four, minus three, along with fludarabine at 30 milligrams per meter squared. There is debate, and I think it's reasonable to consider how much of a role the lymphocyte depleting chemotherapy plays, particularly in flick lymphoma, uh, because coming out of our institution years ago, led by Peter McLaughlin, and we updated recently, outcomes are actually quite good with fludarabine, uh, including as few as four cycles of treatment. Now, again, I recognize this as one-time therapy, uh, but I do think that there might be a potential treatment advantage with the lymphocyte depleting chemo in indolent lymphoma, where I don't believe that to be true in large cell lymphoma. Patients then receive a dose of two times to the six cars per kg, a one-time infusion, and then the primary endpoint was overall response rate with key secondary endpoints outlined. This was the primary endpoint, and again, quite impressive to me is the overall response rate across all patients of 92%. Uh, so to benchmark this in the third line space, the PI3 kinase inhibitors have been approved based off of single arm phase two studies with overall response rates in the 45 to 60% range. So this is dramatically better than anything we've seen thus far in this space. Similarly, we see dramatic complete response rates, particularly in flick lymphoma of 80%. Very few patients with stable disease, again, which is quite different from what we've seen with other agents approved in this setting. Now you can be critical and say, well, the marginal zone lymphoma patients don't do quite as well. In regards to response rate, again, this is quite higher than anything else we've seen uh, thus far, but I do think there is some healthy criticism to be made of the duration of response for the marginal zone lymphoma patients. Now it's a sm much smaller cohort as outlined here by this green curve. You can see it starts to drop off beyond month six, whereas the follicular lymphoma patients in the blue uh, continue to do quite well. Now, the question that is being posed, and I think it's too early to really have a good sense with only 17 months of median follow-up, is this a curative therapy 
for follicular lymphoma, where we do believe it to be curative for large cell lymphoma patients, at least for 40 to maybe 50% of that population. Again, I think it's too early to say, but again, to put this into context, drugs that have been approved in this setting generally have a median PFS of about 11 to 12 months. So this is clearly better than anything else we've seen thus far with a median PFS having not been reached yet. Uh, but you do, you, in my opinion, you don't see the stabilization of these Kaplan-Meier curves, recognizing that as you get out beyond 12 months, very, very small number of patients. Uh, but again, we do need longer follow-up, and particularly in inner lymphoma, uh, to have a sense of whether or not this will be a definitive therapy. Nonetheless, as I mentioned earlier, these are patients that had had a median of about four prior lines of treatment, and those overall survival curves, in my opinion, look quite favorable for this uh, more heavily pretreated patient population. Now, I'd be remiss if we did not talk about toxicity because I, I do think this might be the rate limiting step with CAR T cell therapy and indolent lymphoma, given they have so many other options available to them, uh, many of which have pretty favorable toxicity profile. So the acute toxicity that's been attributed to CAR T thus far uh, is cytokine release syndrome and neurotoxicity, which we pay close attention to in the first 30 days. But with AxiCell, again, because it's a CD28 co-stimulatory molecule, we tend to see most most of this occurring in the first week. And as a result, most of these patients are hospitalized for closer monitoring. What is striking to me, given we've reported on the CRS rates with large cell lymphoma or aggressive histologies, if you look at any grade, three or higher CRS in the follicular lymphoma patients, it's only 6%. So that is better. Now, part of that is we have changed or evolved our mitigating strategies with more aggressive use of things like tocilizumab, which is an anti-IL-6 that blocks the receptor that binds uh, the cytokines produced by these activated T cells. Uh, so there's more liberal use than what was seen in the early Zuma-1 study that led to FDA approval of AxiCell and large cell lymphoma, also more liberal use of corticosteroids. So in my opinion, when you intervene earlier, it makes perfect sense that you're going to have fewer rates of grade three or higher CRS. Nonetheless, it's also important that there was only one patient who had grade five CRS. Again, treatment-related mortality is quite low. It is critical for it to be low for this to have a role in the treatment of flake lymphoma. Equally important is we do see lower rates of neurologic toxicity than what had been reported previously with large cell lymphoma in the follicular group. So again, to put this into context, on average, we see about 30 to 33% rates of grade three or higher neurotoxicity with AxiCell, both in the Zuma-1 study and in the standard of care populations we reported on. So again, this does look like an improvement. However, if you look at, again, the small cohort of marginal zone lymphoma patients, numerically that looks higher than what we've seen reported before. So this now is an interesting discussion. If the toxicity is, differentiated based off of the treatment patient or the population you're treating, uh, that does then bring into question, I fully acknowledge that AxiCell is probably the most toxic of the available autologous uh, cellular therapy we have right now, um, and again, would be a potential um, hindrance to the use, particularly in inner lymphoma, but it is reassuring to me that these rates are lower than what we've seen before. And in my opinion, thus far with tocilizumab and corticosteroids is probably not mitigated by earlier intervention. There are other strategies being employed, such as anakinra, which is an IL-1 blocking therapy that may change that answer. But right now it is reassuring to see that we don't see as high rates of grade three or higher neurotoxicity but I still recognize that 15% of the population, which many of these patients are actually monitored in an ICU setting, is still a heavy resource utilization. And again, may hinder uh, the broad applicability of cellular therapy outside of specialized centers like MD Anderson. The ALARA study was also reported out at ASH this year and is anticipated to lead to FDA approval of TISA cell or TISA gen leclusal, which again is an autologous CD19 uh, cellular therapy. The difference is it has a 4-1BB construct as opposed to CD28. So again, you have a more blunted area of the curve, but potentially more persistence, which again, in an indolent lymphoma process may actually be important. Outlined on this slide are the eligibility criteria, which are similar to Zuma 5, again, enrolling up to grade 3A. 
The conditioning regimen is different. So you can see 25 milligrams per meter squared of fludarabine and 250 milligrams per meter squared of cytoxin. They also allowed for bendamustine because we know that bendamustine is um, toxic to T cells, which again is a difference. And in my opinion, pretty well tolerated or maybe even better tolerated than fludarabine and cytoxin. So the patients I enrolled on this study, I commonly use bendamustine as a conditioning regimen and a different dosing strategy. The primary endpoint was also different as complete response as opposed to overall response rate with Zuma 5. So again, the results have been reported. It's a smaller sample size, though this has been updated and will be has been reported at TCT. It will be reported at uh, EHAN, some of the other meetings coming up with longer follow-up and a larger number of patients available for efficacy. And these rates do hold up. Uh, so a complete response rate of 65%. And again, with shorter follow-up, 10 months of median follow-up, Again, the median duration of response has not been reached. These are follicular lymphoma patients. Um, there's no marginal zone lymphoma cohort uh, in this. And again, as a result of it meeting its primary endpoint, um, this will likely be FDA approved in the US. The safety profile, in my opinion, is differentiated from AxiCell. And that is true also in large cell lymphoma where we see lower rates of grade three or higher cytokine release syndromes. You can see in this uh, slide, there were zero observed in the ALARA study um, in lower rates of neurotoxicity. The third that's anticipated uh, or still underway, but is anticipated to be uh, reported out uh, is the transcend follicular lymphoma study. Uh, so again, for context, Lysacel, which is again, an autologous CD19 uh, CAR T cell therapy with a 4 bb construct. The difference is the CD4 and CD8 CARs are manufactured independent of each other and infused into patients at a fixed ratio. Uh, that was employed after early studies in ALL uh, led to some alarming concerns about toxicity, specifically neurotoxicity as a result of the modification and manufacturing and infusion of fixed ratio. Uh, those concerns have been alleviated. It has been FDA approved for the treatment of large cell lymphoma. It had one of the most broad uh, eligibility criteria. So it's also approved for follicular lymphoma grade 3B um, in addition to a more frail elderly patient population than what we had seen with AxiCell specifically. So this is a cohort looking at follicular lymphoma grade ones again through 3A also enrolling marginal zone lymphoma. We have this study open here at Anderson. It's more complex in that there are cohorts that are defined based off of line of therapy and what prior treatments in response to those prior treatments. Primary endpoint is complete response rate. And again, the study is enrolling quite well. This is the treatment schema. So you can see again, the lymphodepletion looking more similar. Um, to AxiCell as opposed to the Alara study, there's no bendamustine in the lymphocyte depleting therapy. And then we're in the midst of follow-up. So why am I presenting all this CAR T-cell data and not talking about radiation? Well, stepping back a little bit, this is work led by Chelsea Pinnock at our group, looking at the role of radiation bridging in patients treated with standard of care AxiCell. So this is large cell lymphoma, so different context. However, most of those patients, particularly in the standard of care setting, had failed multiple lines of therapy. So the median had been three prior treatments. And we were learning that bridging, particularly with chemoimmunotherapy, and the most commonly used chemotherapy in our group has been hypercytoxin, uh, was not resulting in favorable strategies to get patients to CAR T. Now, I fully recognize their selection bias and that the patients that were being prescribed bridging therapy were higher risk at the onset, uh, so higher rates of IPI, high risk, more advanced stage, bulky disease, higher LDH and B symptoms. Um, nonetheless, it did not appear that our chemotherapy strategies were successful. So we then reached out to our radiation oncology colleagues um, who have been phenomenal at minimizing toxicity, but also achieving adequate disease control. And so then we, pull, we pulled all of our uh, retrospective cases um, including those that receive bridging therapy outlined in the red curve here versus the chemoimmunotherapy um, in the yellow curve and then systemic therapy. So you can see, again, small numbers, but there does appear to be a trend, and it is statistically significant that radiotherapy uh, tended to benefit patients um, who, again, were felt to be um, poor candidates for that time delay from leukapheresis manufacturing and infusion of cells. 
So I do think in the right hands, radiation can be a very successful bridging strategy uh, for cellular therapy. So my transcend study that we have open at MD Anderson does allow for bridging, whereas with AxiCell there to date, most of the prospective studies have not allowed for any bridging outside of um, steroids. With the Alara study, there could be bridging employed, and over half the patients did receive bridging, even though it was a follicle lymphoma study, and that was at the discretion of the treating physician, with most of those patients continue on chemotherapy bridging. With the transcend study, you could they did allow for radiation as bridging as well. So this was one of the first patients we enrolled in the study at MD Anderson. It's a 74-year-old male, very active, retired engineer, um, actually was appalled to have to spend four weeks away from his regular activities to be in Houston for the monitoring of recovery uh, post CAR-T to the point that he almost declined the study. Uh, but he had failed a number of treatments, including our CHOP. He'd had a course of rituximab monotherapy for about two years. He had failed bendamustine rituximab and was failing copanlisib. And so this was his scout film on his PET study. And you can see the bulk of his disease was in the mesentery. Um, and this does not portray the extent of it very well, but this mass was actually palpable on the surface. Um, so it's over eight centimeters in the greatest uh, diameter. And with four gray employed uh, by one of uh, Dr. Debaja's colleagues here, you can see he had a dramatic response. And this uh, was also quite impressive to me that not only did he have a dramatic response in the mesenteric mass that was targeted, but even some of the extra nodal sites, including in the pelvis um, nodes above the diaphragm also responded, suggesting that we had kind of an abscopal effect which was perfect, in my opinion, going into cellular therapy. Um, so two days after this PET scan, because he still had measurable disease, he went on to receive Lysacel on the Transcend study. And so that was about um, September of 2020. And I saw him on Tuesday this week, he's still in a complete response. So I do think that there is a role, even for low dose radiation for bridging, particularly in these inner lymphoma patients that are being considered for cellular therapy. And based off of observations from Chelsea Pinnock's work in the large cell space, um, working together with Penny on this patient. So Dr. Penny Fang is a PI here of a prospective study that she's exploring the use of radiation, both as a bridging therapy, as a potential conditioning therapy, and we'll be comparing that to patients who don't receive any uh, radiation undergoing standard of care CAR T cell therapy. So I, I do think that defining this in a prospective manner would be helpful for the community at large, because again, I recognize the expertise at our center uh, in terms of mitigating toxicity, but also defining patients who are optimal candidates um, for bridging radiation or consolidated radiation. Um, you may not be able to reproduce that outside of centers like our own, uh, but being able to share this information with the community at large and defining it in a prospective manner would be critical to maintain this momentum. Shifting gears a little bit, we also have other cellular therapies that are under exploration, particularly at MD Anderson, uh, through the work of Katie Resvani and EJ Schwal. Uh, they are taking cord bloods, um, deriving NK cells, then using a retrovirus to introduce, again, an extracellular CD19 receptor. All of these to date have the same uh, extracellular CD19 directed receptor. Um, then they're in, we're exploring this in a first in human phase one dose escalation study uh, with patients with hematologic malignancies expressing CD19. Uh, I've recently taken over as PI of this study, um, and my impression of this is there are potential advantages of the car and cave program, so it's an allogeneic off-the-shelf product, so that may help mitigate some of the um, issues with an autologous T cells. So you don't have to collect, you don't have to manufacture. Um, it's independent of HLA matching. There's very low or no rates of GVHD. Um, it's Toxicity profile is much more favorable uh, because you don't have the rapid cytokine release and massive T cell expansion that results in a lot of the CRS and neurotoxicity we've seen with the autologous products to date, particularly with AxiCell. And as a result, in utilizing these NK cells, uh, it might lend itself to combination strategies, particularly with things like CD20 uh, antibodies, where you could potentially have dual targeting um, in opposed to just the CD19 alone. So this is the phase one study. Um, we're still 
We have completed the dose escalation. We're in expansion right now, still exploring uh, safety and efficacy signal. We have not seen any neurotoxicity to date, and we've treated about 35 patients. Uh, we have seen one grade one CRS to date. There have been no DLTs. So it's actually challenging to find or define the recommended phase two dose. We're currently at 800 million cells. There are other NK products that are under development. So Fate Therapeutics, we also have this study open at MD Anderson with Palo Strati, the PI of the trial. They have, in addition to the extracellular receptor targeting CD19, they've done additional genetic modifications to enhance uh, the persistence of these allogeneic stem cells. And as opposed to deriving these from cord blood, they're derived from a, a pluripotent stem cell. Uh, so you can see here, they have the non-cleavable CD16 and the IL-15 receptor fusion. Again, all attempts to improve persistence with these allogeneic uh, products. Their phase one uh, dose escalation study, either as monotherapy or in combination with uh, obinutuzumab or rituximab, again, CD20 antibodies is underway, and we are enrolling on this uh, study here at Anderson as well. So again, where would I see a role for radiation in these trials? Well, the timing of CAR T-cell therapy, particularly the autologous product, has been challenging, particularly in the aggressive lymphoma subtypes where um, time is everything. And so again, utilizing bridging strategies, particularly in our center, have been very effective ways to address these rapidly proliferating tumors. However, CAR T cell therapy in general has been underutilized, I think because of the logistics and the heavy resource utilization and the requirement for patients to leave either their community-based practice and travel to a specialized center, take time away from work, there's so many barriers, I think it's pretty easy to explore alternative options, and I fully acknowledge that. So if there are strategies that we can employ uh, to enhance the efficacy, because again, if we can cure a large number of patients, I think those barriers will be justifiable or overcome. But if it's underutilized in large cell lymphoma, where we all pretty much agree that you can cure a, a cohort of patients, how will it ever be utilized in an indolent lymphoma process where Again, the perception is that patients aren't gonna die from their disease, but they may die from other things like competing risks of death. Whether again, that is true or false, I think that is the common perception. They have so many other treatment options that can be administered in a community setting that are generally well tolerated and quite effective. You'll probably hear more about those in the next lecture. So how can we identify patients who really we think should be pursuing this resource heavy potentially less favorable toxicity profile, but the potential to provide a one-time treatment in your done approach. So again, I think any strategy that we can explore to make that argument stronger, such as the incorporation of radiation, either as bridging or even consolidation. So there are reports of consolidated radiation therapy in multiple myeloma. We have data here that I didn't show you looking at consolidated radiation in the post-NK CAR setting, where again, you're trying to mitigate um, some of that antigen expression disrupt that tumor microenvironment that sometimes is hard to penetrate by some of these therapies so that we can try and ensure that patients won't be relapsing multiple times and continuing down that course of that first slide I showed you of nine plus treatments and survival getting dramatically shorter with each one. The main competition, in my opinion, will probably be the bispecific antibodies to CAR T cell therapy, particularly in follicular lymphoma. So a bispecific antibody essentially engages the tumor antigen and CD3 uh, positive T cells. And by bringing them into close proximity, we think leads to T cell engagement and activation of these um, T cells, which we think then leads to um, cytotoxicity. There's a little bit of magic in that and that we don't fully, under, or at least I don't fully understand um, exactly how this process works. But again, I think there is, again, potential role um, for strategies employing radiation as well. At ASH this year, we saw the phase one or 1B results of four uh, bispecific antibodies that target CD20 and CD3. Uh, there are differences in the structure. Um, it's hard to really say at this point if there's one that's preferred over another one, either based off of safety or efficacy, because uh, in my opinion, they look to be, they have similar um, profiles. Mosentuzumab we have open here at MD Anderson, um, and the phase 1B 
an expansion into flake lymphoma has now gathered quite a few patients and the overall response rate looks to be pretty favorable, uh, particularly in follicular lymphoma patients. Uh, there is still some dose finding in mitigating strategies because CRS is a common or class effect. The problem in my opinion is this could also be described as infusion reaction that most of these patients have fever um, either during infusion or within 12 to 18 hours after infusion, um, shaking chills, and that is essentially the extent of it. We don't see the multi-organ dysfunction uh, like we've seen with CAR T-cell therapy. Very rarely do patients need any mitigating strategies such as corticosteroids or tocilizumab, and it's almost unheard of for a patient to end up in the ICU. However, because cytokine release syndrome is the descriptor for these symptoms, um, patients are treated and maintained close to a center where we have strategies like tocilizumab uh, to abort some of these toxicities. And so until some of these change, I don't know that this will also make its way into the community practices um, at least not at this point. There are strategies being employed such as step up or ramp up where you start with a really low dose and then you get a little bit higher dose and then you finally get to high dose by the third week or subcutaneous injection of these uh, drugs. So you have a blunted absorption. So again, you don't have that marked T cell engagement and activation leading to these symptoms. Again, I think there are strategies that could be employed with radiation, particularly during the ramp up to try and slow disease proliferation, because in my experience, the large cell lymphoma patients, at least with the Mosin study, have not done as well, because many of them progress rapidly during that three week ramp up. So again, despite our hope that this uh, will potentially replace cellular therapy because it's more readily available. Um, I do think that the ramp up may still limit this to certain patients um, that don't have rapidly proliferating disease or provide opportunity for bridging strategies with bispecifics as well. So where is it going next? In large cell lymphoma this year at ASH, we saw bispecifics moving into frontline uh, to replace rituximab. In follicular lymphoma, it's being combined with lenalidomide, again, a cell mod that activates both T cells and NK cells. Uh, so to me, that's an intriguing combination. Um, and then again, can we combine this with radiation either as a bridging strategy or a post bispecific infusion? So we did have one patient on the Mosin very early on. It was a large cell patient that had failed CAR T cell therapy. It was progressing pretty rapidly. And so he is someone that we um, supported with radiation. He ended up doing quite well and lived about another 12 months. So this is my last uh, slide. So to conclude, I do think the treatment landscape in follicular lymphoma is rapidly expanding, and I just covered the approval of AxiCell. Alara is anticipated to be approved, and we also anticipate mosentuzumab, the bispecific antibody, uh, to be next in the pipeline. That's in addition to the wealth of drugs we already have. So how will we actually choose um, patients for these more aggressive, resource-heavy uh, therapies? I do think there will start to be more heterogeneity in the approach based off of whether a patient is treated in a community setting versus an academic setting, whether they're treated in the U.S. versus outside of the U.S. Um, and so I, I think that's disappointing in a sense for patients. So that also, in my mind, highlights the need for us to continue to explore the standard of care outcomes so we can continue to address how patients are actually um, being treated, what the outcomes of those treatments are in terms of both efficacy and safety, but we're doing all this because we're still striving to cure this disease. And I think there are a couple of things that would be success if we have a one-time treatment that is their last treatment, and then they live for 10 to 15 more years without therapy. That to me would be successful, even if the price to play is a little bit higher in terms of toxicity, as long as we're not killing patients with that therapy. However, one definition of success could also be that they don't have progression events they're maintained on a therapy that is very well tolerated and doesn't impact their quality of life, either from a toxicity standpoint or time given up spent with us, then that too could be viewed as success. So that's why I think flake lymphoma is so intriguing and I like studying it because there's not a wrong answer. I have to acknowledge uh, the faculty here again. Thank you, Dr. Debaja, you've been phenomenal to work with, but she's got a wealth of phenomenal people with her, Chelsea, Jill, Penny, Susan, and then my lymphoma colleagues. And with that, I will end. Thank you so much. That was such a powerful presentation. We learned a ton. And I think 
uh, it opened a lot of gates for us to collaborate, uh, not only in the party, but the in, in the NK car also, me and Penny, we submitted for a possible grant this week uh, to our radiation uh, uh, forum to uh, start using radiation prior to NK car. So hopefully this is gonna go through. Thank you so much. We truly learn a lot and we appreciate your expertise and your knowledge. I'm going to move to Dr. Dilsar that I'm super excited also to have and hear his uh, future direction and hopefully how we can introduce radiation and use it to the best of what can radiation offer. Dr. J uh, Saul, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Dabaj, and um, thank you, uh, everybody. Hello to Loretta, and um, glad to see uh, you all. I mean, it's a uh, communities that uh, um, many of you are not familiar with, but I'm glad to be here. And uh, I, I realized that probably there were nobody from my former country. As you know, I worked in France for many years and, and joined the US this year. And um, beside all the challenges and interest in working with a fantastic group also here at Memorial, it gave me the opportunity also to interact uh, closely with uh, uh, Aki Yahalom and also rediscover a little bit radiation therapy, which was a little bit maybe uh, um, less utilized, uh, at least in, in, in France. So um, I was developing this uh, talk as more an introductory talk, but let's, let, let's move through it and try to, to, to see uh, uh, what else we can uh, discuss uh, on, on the topic of follicular lymphoma. Uh, these are my disclosure. So let's start with a, a very uh, simple uh, uh, presentation, which is the epidemiology of this disease, at least in Western countries. And I, I just brought this uh, uh, slide, which was the epidemiological data coming from France, published by the French National Cancer Institute, showing that uh, uh, basically over 20 years, the number of patients with this disease has almost doubled. And the data come from 2000 at a time where pathological diagnosis was really uh, uh, already well established for follicular lymphoma as a regional mixture with other uh, indolent lymphoma. So that's something that uh, we probably see in uh, uh, Western countries, unsure whether it applies to, to other parts of the world. Although I, I saw recently, and I see we have colleagues from uh, Australia, that Australia is the country with the highest incidence of lymphoma uh, uh, in the world. The second point is all the progress that has been made in the last 20 years or, or, or more with the uh, uh, development of monoclonal antibody and particularly uh, uh, rituximab and what we have learned. And what we have learned, and this is a work we have done in collaboration with colleagues from uh, Mayo Clinic, is that if the first treatment does not fail, well, patients will experience a prolonged survival. And we had set up here a, 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 a threshold of 12 months. All the papers have been published by Kala Kazula at 24 months. These data have been reproduced over and over. But as you can see is on the left, is that the patients that did not have an event at 12 months had an overall survival expectation at probably six to eight years that parallel or maybe even better than the uh, expected survival of an HMH population. While those patients that failed the early intervention uh, had actually a worse outcome. Well, this is true for patients managed with immunochemotherapy, with patients uh, uh, managed with rituximab single agent. Your group actually published that this is also true for patients treated with radiation therapy. And in the same initial paper uh, uh, with Matt Mora, we found that patients that were dedicated to observation but had to be treated before 12 months also had an inferior outcome. So as mentioned, this may be very reassuring, but as uh, uh, Loretta Nastupil, Nastupil alluded to, um, we also worked uh, in collaboration with the same group and uh, uh, found that when we look at the uh, uh, cause of death of patients with follicular lymphoma over years, we realized that the lymphoma remained the uh, uh, major cause of death followed very close by by treatment-related deaths, which clearly uh, uh, pose the questions regarding the sequencing of different treatments, other malignancies, other causes, and obviously unknown. And you may say, well, this is true probably for younger patients, but this is also true for 
uh, a patient diagnosed over the age of, uh, of 70. I won't go into detail regarding prognostic index. There have been the development of FLIPI, FLIPI2. Uh, we developed an index which was called Prima PI based on beta 2 microglobulin and identification of uh, serological factors uh, identified, I will say, 30 years ago or more by Peter Malofflin in, in um, MD Anderson. And uh, well, if you combine beta 2 microglobulin and bone marrow involvement, you have a very simple index, and this has been reproduced. Uh, uh, by many colleagues, even in patients with uh, low tumor burden treated with immunotherapy and, and others. So we felt this is a quite easy way to uh, assess the outcome of patients. At least it's our PFS probability, not OS. Um, obviously the field is moving and we all try to find other parameters. I just uh, mentioned on this slide two of them. One is the uh, tumor volume. And uh, with Michel Mignon and co-workers and uh, others, we have identified that the, metab the total metabolic tumor volume was associated, identified by PET, was associated with uh, a different outcome. These data are a little bit conflicting because they may uh, depend on the type of therapy you are applying. And if you look a little bit uh, 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 closer to recent publication with the Gallium study, this may not have been reproduce and raise questions regarding the influence of this tumor volume. I thought, logically, we will expect that. Um, another way to assess the uh, prognosis of the patient is the presence of either circulating cells, obviously, but also uh, circulating tumor DNA. Uh, we published this paper years ago in a few patients treated with Prima. Uh, there are many uh, ongoing studies examining uh, uh, circulating tumor DNA, either with immunoglobulin gene rearrangements or uh, a mutation panel characteristic of this lymphoma. Uh, but basically, and when you have a high volume of circulating tumor DNA, uh, these patients do less well as if you have your volume. And you can obviously combine those factors as uh, my colleague did. Well, the field is moving and we all expect that the biology of this disease will help us to predict outcome. And there have been uh, several efforts uh, that were made in recent years. Uh, the first one was laid by our colleague from Germany together with a group of uh, uh, Vancouver. And they basically built an index, which were called M7 Flippy, which actually was original in combining the presence uh, of a mutation in seven genes, some of them associated with an adverse prognosis, others associated with a better prognosis, together with, sorry, together with the FLIPI index and together with the performance status. So it's really a mixed model bringing together uh, 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 some biological parameters with clinical parameters. And they were able to show that the main advantage of this index was actually to segregate patients that had not a very good outcome in an intermediate group and a poor risk group. Unfortunately, this was not yet reproduced by many other uh, a, a group or, or, or the data set, and uh, uh, we'll discuss that later. We took another approach and published that now uh, uh, three years ago in Lancet Oncology, uh, where instead of looking simply at mutations that are characteristic of tumor cells, we looked at the gene expression profile within the leaf node and identified several genes that basically reflected multiple aspects of the tumor biology, not only the tumor cells themselves and proliferation and commitment maybe to uh, uh, what we'll call stemness, but also the microenvironment, which we know is, is dramatically important in species. Again, we have published that, but uh, uh, these data were not reproduced recently in the Gallium study. So what are the issues with reproducibility of this uh, uh, biological-based index? I think it's the tumor heterogeneity, which is a major issue. We know that if we take two lymph nodes at different places in the same patient, some patterns of mutation may differ, some microenvironment may differ, and that it, it may be difficult to have a common signature for this disease with the tool we have presently, although maybe with circulating tumor DNA or more sophisticated approach of uh, 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 circulated genomics will have some uh, uh, other aspect. And the second point, which I believe is very important because it's also applied to clinically-based index 
are different interactions between the treatments and the tumor microenvironment. And for instance, um, cytoxin and uh, uh, adriblastin in CHOP have probably preserved some T cell but destroyed some highly proliferative cells and may modulate the uh, uh, fate and uh, differentiation of macrophages, while bendamastin uh, is a T cell depleting agent. And this may explain the differences between these index. So let's move to uh, a, a little bit the, the, the questions uh, uh, regarding clinics. And I hesitated uh, showing this slide, which I used to, to, to show in several meetings. Um, what happens in 2021? Well, in patients with localized disease, I won't mention here during this uh, uh, forum that involved radiation therapy is definitely a strategy that is recommended by many groups in many places. However, I will say, and uh, I, I still will be uh, help, happy to continue to debate that in the setting, that watchful waiting can be adopted in some of these patients. And whether really these patients are cured with radiation therapy remains debatable after 15, 20 years. But again, that's another question. Uh, recently, a study from uh, 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 Australia and other colleagues have shown that rituximab containing systemic therapies are proved to improve PFS after radiation. Whether we will change the way we manage this patient when we apply radiation or not is, is another question. I won't discuss here the dose of radiation therapy. I'm not an expert on that, but I'm sure that Aki Halam in his next talk will eventually discuss that. When patients have more disseminated disease and a low tumor burden or asymptomatic disease, I will say that the management of this patient remains uncertain. Uh, watch and wait is clearly probably the option that is adopted by uh, many centers through the world. Rituximab single agent does work. Uh, three quarters of the patient respond to therapy, half of them having a CR, but it lasts two to three years. And using prolonged courses of rituximab for this patient hasn't been shown to improve the outcome. Whether other approach may eventually help to put this patient in very prolonged response, complete response, and eventually lead to potential cure of this patient is debatable. Well, for all the other patients that probably represent 50 to 60% of the patient we encounter in, in, in the clinics, um, the use of a monoclonal antibody uh, directed against C20 plus chemotherapy remains standard of care. What we have learned is that the combination of bendamustine with rituximab is probably superior to rituximab sharp although some gallium results may still challenge that. Both of them are superior to RCVP for progression-free survival, but it should be noted that there were no difference in overall survival between these different regimen in several trials. Rituximab maintenance improved progression-free survival, but not overall survival in patients that respond to this therapy. Obinutuzumab, who is an antibody, which is an antibody that has improved ADCC, improved PFS over rituximab, but not overall survival. And finally, the combination of rituximab and alindamide, the R-square regimen, uh, which was pioneered by our colleague of Andy Anderson and Nathan Fowler in particular, has been evaluated in a large international study that we, uh, in which we collaborated together, but wasn't found superior to uh, our chemo. So that's where we are. But again, we have to take into account, as Loretta mentioned, that the 10-year survival of this patient reached 80%. So when we think about this, this patient and how to sequence the treatment, we should also think about the future of this patient. I just would like to show just the update of the PRIMA study, which were essentially patients treated with RCHOP followed by rituximab maintenance, just to outline that I don't know whether we cure or not this patient, but basically, as you can see, for those patients that receive rituximab maintenance at 10 years, half of them have not progressed. So I don't know if these patients are cured, but I tend to uh, usually uh, try to modulate all my colleagues that start their papers uh, with follicular lymphoma saying it's an incurable disease because I'm not sure it's, it, it's completely true. As a matter of fact, the survival of this patient is uh, 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 pretty long. Um, I just show this result just to mention that in the relapse setting, there have been development of several agents. Obinutuzumab has developed here initially, bendamustine also. 
and just as an old style treatment, but still that was valuable and probably mostly used in Europe rather than the United States was autologous stem cell transplant for these patients. I thought recently there was some uh, 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 re-evaluation of uh, uh, this treatment in patients with early failure. But just to mention that while we do see treatment that basically uh, have a median PFS as mentioned of one to two years, here we have a median PFS of autotransplant that lasts several years. Well, what is new with that? And basically uh, this uh, curve uh, 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 mirrors those that uh, are, have been shown by uh, uh, Loretta in her former talk. And this was work done by Connie Batlevy in our group, uh, looking at the overall survival by lines of therapy and progression-free survival by line of therapy. And as you can see, when we come to second, third line and more, you see that the benefit in terms of PFS is in the range of eventually two to three years. And in terms of overall survival, we lose years uh, over the disease. So we have a couple of new options and I won't discuss them here uh, uh, extensively because obviously uh, 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 this will take another hour. Uh, I underline here the ones that have been approved in the setting of follicular lymphoma and one, uh, 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 two were recently approved, which are AxiCell uh, 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 developed by uh, Loretta and Umbralizib, uh, which was recently approved. But let's go over a few things. Um, as mentioned, the combination of rituximab plus lenidomide was investigated uh, uh, several years ago by different group of investigators. Um, it basically implied the, uh, the concept that uh, using lenalidomide in the presence of a monoclonal antibody reinforces the uh, uh, recognition of the target cell by immune effector cells, in particular T cell, and help basically uh, uh, to kill uh, uh, this follicular cell. And this was demonstrated in a trial that compared with Tuximab single agent versus R squared. Well, you will say this is now uh, uh, practical, but I think uh, uh, it's important to keep that in mind. This is an option that has become widely available in the last two years, especially in patients that failed uh, chemotherapy or immunochemotherapy. And uh, uh, I think uh, it represents clearly uh, probably another standard of care widely used uh, uh, in the world. A few words regarding targeted molecules and uh, targeted small molecules targeting the uh, signaling pathway in uh, uh, B cells. As you know, B cell express this B cell receptor as a surface, but also many chymokine receptors, toll-like receptors, uh, CD40 ligand and cytokine receptors. And the signaling uh, uh, within, uh, uh, delivered by this receptor where they encounter the ligand uh, follow a couple of pathways involving PIC kinase, and the Bruton tyrosine kinase. I won't develop and say too much words regarding the Bruton tyrosine kinase in follicular lymphoma. One of the trials that uh, uh, was aiming to show the activity of this drug in patients that being failed over therapy actually failed to meet its primary endpoint. And that's how all the BDK inhibitors are still in development. Uh, it's a little bit uncertain how they will fit in the uh, armamentarium against follicular lymphoma. Regarding PI3 kinase, uh, we published not several years ago the activity of the first uh, PI3 kinase delta, idelalizib, in patients with uh, uh, follicular lymphoma. And I will say the first time I saw this uh, uh, waterfall plot, I said, well, that reminds me of what I have seen 10 years before with rituximab. Basically, uh, half of the patient responded to therapy and very few patients progress uh, uh, with therapy. And this really led to this enthusiasm regarding the development of these uh, uh, kinase inhibitors. Well, right now, and I haven't updated this slide with the approval of uh, 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 umbralizib, but we have idelalizib, duvelizib, companbizib, and uh, uh, umbralizib, which has been evaluated in patients, usually with double refractory disease or relapsed disease. Well, what I would like to stress is that the response rate range from 40 to 60%, uh, as already mentioned, but the number of patients that reach a complete response is very limited. 
from one up to 20%. And the median progression free survival, the median duration of response is about one year. And part of the reason is probably the limited efficacy of this drug, but the other reason is a pattern of toxicity with several toxicities that are either hematological or organ uh, directed or uh, a little bit atypical. As mentioned, umbralizib now is approved. Vipalizib has been abandoned in this field. Zandelizib and parsaclizib are still uh, developed with different intermittent dosing. What we have learned is that some side effects are really compound specific. This is the case for hepatotoxicity of uh, edelalizib. Some are isoform specific, such as hyperglycemia for the alpha inhibition with bupalizib, for instance, or um, copanizib, and some are class specific, such as diarrhea with the delta inhibitor. So I won't go into detail too much about these agents. They uh, require basically continuous dosing. The side effect may be an issue, and the duration of response may limit the use. The last family of drugs that has been approved in this setting, and I think it's important because this is uh, a new concept that came to the clinic, is the uh, EZH2 inhibitor tazemetostat. We know that the initial molecular event in follicular lymphoma are really a couple of mutations uh, targeting the epigenetic machinery, such as mutation in KPP, EPP300, and uh, 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 KMD2D. EZH, EZH2 is a, a, a compound of a big complex called PRC2 that really control the exit of a B cell from the germinal centers and allow them to differentiate in memory B cell and plasma cell. There are mutations of EZH2, which are encountered in 20 to 25% of patients with follicular lymphoma, and this mutation are thought to block basically the differentiation of these cells and increase the proliferation and uh, participate to the transformation process. There may be other mechanism of activation of this pathway. Tazemetostat, which has been the first uh, inhibitor uh, 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 neural agent for uh, the drug target, has been developed and quite interesting and surprisingly has been active in patients with mutation of EZH2, as you can see here in this waterfall plot, but also in this patient without the mutation of EZH2. And there are reasons for that that we can discuss in another setting. So this just summarizes the result we published recently in Lancet Oncology uh, with colleagues involved in this disease, an overall response rate of 70% with a CR rate of 13% in mutated patient, 35% for the wild type patient with a low response. But again, the progression free survival and duration of response is low. Also, I will say that this agent is generally uh, better tolerated than the uh, PI3 kinase inhibitors. I won't go into details regarding the bispecific, what I already uh, I mentioned that, but just to mention that if we summarize the results that were updated this year at ASH in patients with follicular lymphoma, as you can see, we reach usually a novel response rate that is greater than 50% and even a CR rate, which is uh, very appealing and consistent. And I won't discuss CAR T7 this year. So maybe to conclude and open the discussion, and I know that uh, uh, the, the question of uh, how, how radiation therapy fits here uh, 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 will be uh, discussed, but I, I will say there are not necessarily uh, uh, strong guidelines for that. There are many questions of how we should sequence a different kind of therapy in follicular lymphoma. First of all, there is a question of the patients that have an early progression. And I will say is that early progression of early transformation because that indicates that many of these patients, in fact, if we do a biopsy, have a transformation. And how for the other patients we manage the sequencing of therapy, how do we manage the chronicity are questions that are uh, 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 will take another time to discuss. I just brought here maybe uh, uh, as a conclusion, a few algorithms at the relapse setting. I think if we have patients that uh, have not been previously exposed to immunochemotherapy, if, uh, 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 oh, sorry, yeah. If they uh, have not been exposed to immunochemotherapy, if they progress early, if they are fit, if they have a heart tumor burden, that's the time to deliver that. For all low tumor burden patients, late relapse frail patients, 
I think we have several strategies here, which include watchful waiting. Most patients can be usually watched for some time, rituximab single agent and radiation therapy with uh, either low dose or uh, intermediate optimal dose in, in your film. But again, I think for all these patients, we should eliminate uh, histological transformation. When patients relapse and how to sequence patients that have been exposed to immunochemotherapy, that's another question, depending on what the type of compounds they have received, they can start again immunochemotherapy. I think R-square had became a very satisfactory option here. A few patients may be consolidated with autologous stem cell transplant and anti-C20 maintenance basically here. But as you can see, afterwards, we have many options, including this PI3 kinase inhibitor, tazemetostar, R-square if it wasn't used, alternative have chemo, autologous stem cell transplant, CAR T cell, which have been recently approved, and by specific, which will be in the near future. And if the patient doesn't need a systemic intervention or an intervention, I think there is space for uh, uh, different options here. So I have said that most of the patients die uh, after being diagnosed with follicular lymphoma. But in fact, if we look a little bit in details at uh, the cause of death of this patient and further uh, uh, dig into that, we can see that the proportion of patients that die from lymphoma without transformation is low. And the major cause of death, in fact, of patients with follicular lymphoma is the occurrence of this histologic transformation. So maybe one of the most challenging questions for us for the future is to predict that. And I will say, unfortunately, at this time, despite all the progress we have made in understanding the biology of this disease, there are several uh, uh, pitfalls and roadblocks in trying to investigate at diagnosis who are these patients that may transform because uh, the linear evolution which we see in certain cancer and may help eventually to identify some mutations that may be associated with a higher risk of transformation is one of the pathway, but all the pathway could be the apparition of new mutations and the detections of clone that even were not detected at diagnosis. So maybe to conclude this, this talk, first of all, um, the choice is the fertilized setting is important. And I think achieving long-term disease free is important in the first line, as this was mentioned by uh, uh, Loretta earlier on. Uh, but I think now we have tools also that allow to have long-term disease free interval in second line and further setting. Um, not all patients with progressive disease need a therapeutic intervention, and maybe some symptoms could be controlled. And again, radiation therapy can fit here also. Um, toxicities matter, and I think this is important. And again, histological transformation is clearly a concern for our patient. I would like to acknowledge here all my colleagues from my previous group, but also my colleagues from Memorial. And if you are further interested in Informa, I invite you to our annual symposium, which will be virtual this year and take place in uh, May. And Aki Yahalam will also discuss some uh, of the future of radiation therapy in follicular lymphoma. Thank you for having me. I try to um, see what could be the future. Obviously, uh, a longer discussion will be here and how Loretta has alluded to combining radiation therapy with some of these agents may further enhance the activity and for her further enhance the applicability and good result for our patient. Thank you again. Thank you so much. That was also a great uh, presentation. Um, I wanted before going to uh, Dr. Yahalom, I have a one housekeeping uh, announcement and uh, a question to uh, both of you. Uh, so it seems when the time zone has changed in the United States, uh, which Europe lagged behind, uh, that uh, messed up the calendar for most of our European, and I'm guessing our Asian friends, and that's why we've noticed a lag in the people that uh, signed in. Uh, well, uh, it's too late, obviously, right now, but that's why we're finding people signing in at the uh, turn of the hour. Uh, for, for those, those of you who could not attend it, I want to tell you that we usually record it and we are recording right now and we'll post it on our website and hopefully we can also send you a link so you can uh, later on watch it. Um, 
the question that I had for uh, uh, both uh, of our uh, speakers is, and I will read two actually, one from uh, John Plasteras and the other one from uh, Tim Elledge. Uh, the way we're thinking about radiation right now is not the way we thought about it 20, 30 years ago, which is we're not thinking about a lethal dose, but rather a sublethal dose that would stimulate the immune system. How open do you think the medical on, uh, oncology community to introduce radiation in that new format rather than thinking of it that, oh, I don't wanna give radiation and cause a lot of harm. Dr. Sal, I will start with you. You're muted. I'm gonna ask you to unmute. Well, I, I, as I mentioned, I think that um, we have to probably rationally develop uh, combination therapies. And I think that uh, what was mentioned by Loretta in her talk regarding uh, the um, abscopal effect, what kind of immune modification can be observed, especially with uh, low dose radiation therapy is something that uh, we need to investigate and take advantage uh, of that to build rational combination. Um, I think um, we have way to control this disease, whether it's localized or disseminated with um, either systemic therapy, including cytotoxic agent or localized radiation therapy for patient with localized disease. But um, I think if we want to really cure this disease for uh, a long-term benefit, we have either to target the uh, uh, original cell and that's probably a little bit complex and maybe epigenetic intervention will help or really fully modify the uh, immune environment and microenvironment of this cell. And I think that what has been shown with low dose radiation uh, is that there are profound modification of this environment when you use it. And I think this really paved the way to combine that with different immune intervention. And I would say um, it can go back to rituximab, which was one of the first agent, but obviously with CAR T and by specific, the interest is renewed. So I think we should really try to develop uh, uh, models that help us to evaluate that yeah, uh, yeah. in vitro and then uh, evaluate them in patients. Okay, thank you. Dr. Nestapul, do you have a comment on that? I completely agree. I guess the only additional thoughts is there's been a lot of attention placed on the late toxicities and we all recognize that radiation works exquisitely well in lymphoma. So anything you can do to address that, whether it's more targeted fields, whether it's lower dose, I do think there's still a role of radiation. We just have to address um, those concerns so that it doesn't go away. Okay, uh, Dr. Illich, would you like Tim to uh, comment yourself or you would like me to read your comment? I'm happy to comment, thank you. Uh, Go ahead. Really great presentations for, from you both um, and a question to you both. I, I could argue that radium therapy is arguably the most single active agent um, in follicular lymphoma. It wasn't mentioned at all. Beta-lutein was FDA fast-tracked in 2019. So is there no future for radiomyotherapy? And if so, is this related to logistics rather than efficacy? Question number two, uh, um, no mention of antibody drug conjugates. Do you see a place for ADCs in uh, treatment of follicular lymphoma? Certainly the, the data in uh, aggressive lymphoma and in Hodgkin lymphoma looks quite exciting. Comments? Okay, hello team and nice seeing you. Um, well, radioimmunotherapy has been available in several countries and, as you said, underused. However, we have to remember that the first radioimmunotherapy compounds that was uh, basically available were directed against CD20. And um, the efficacy in patients that have been exposed to the naked antibody has been probably less interesting than uh, what we had anticipated when it was used in patients that were naive of, uh, 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 of uh, this exposure. 
As you mentioned, the betalutine, which is, uh, if I recall well, again, CD37, is an exciting drug. There is a current trial in patients with double refractory disease. I think we are eager to see this, this result. I agree that the logistic is an issue, although it can be solved in many places. It's a one-time treatment, and that makes it very appealing. Uh, the toxicity is rather limited, so I think there may be a space, but probably we have to see what this novel agent will, will, will help us. Regarding ADC, I think I have a little bit more concerns, to tell you the truth. Um, I think this is another way of delivering a toxic agent to the tumor site. And I will say, given all what we have in the field, given the toxicity of this agent, in particular peripheral neuropathy, I am a little bit unsure that there will really be major players in the future, as opposed to what we expect in uh, uh, diffuse last piece and mean, That's my opinion, and um, uh, Loretta may have other as opinions. No, I actually agree with all those comments. I've actually said that I have concern that CAR T will be the radio immunotherapy of the modern era if we can't figure out how to deliver it in a more efficient and convenient manner. So. I don't, I don't have anything else to add. Perfect. Uh, I do not see any other uh, questions uh, in the chat, unless somebody would like to add uh, one right now. I'll move to Dr. Yahalom, who's gonna go through his uh, innovative idea on how to collaborate. Dr. Yahalom? Yeah, that's maybe beyond that slightly and ties uh, in into the new era of radiation uh, in the lymphoma, the first uh, 10 years of field work, we focused on reducing the field and perfecting the field and uh, writing uh, more than 15 uh, guidelines. And I think uh, the last couple of years and we reflected uh, in organizing uh, this uh, webinar and is uh, our really interaction uh, with the new drugs, with the new immunotherapy check, uh, checkpoint inhibitors, and of course, CAR T cells. But we also have to remember that 30% of the patients with lymphoma present in early stage and may remain, uh, many of them in early stage, and uh, we need uh, to treat them efficiently and without uh, toxicity. So the new era of uh, radiation therapy is really uh, in reduction, uh, the dose. Uh, and we hear a distinguish in uh, follicular lymphoma uh, and with marginal zone lymphoma between the patients who are we call potentially curable. And these are the untreated early stage with localized disease. And of course, we use radiation therapy very effectively uh, after many lines of uh, chemotherapy in the advanced and previously treated uh, relapsed patients. I just want to remind everybody of the past and we have known for many, many years from these uh, studies that use uh, different doses and different fields of radiation therapy that if we subject the patients uh, in early stage to radiation uh, therapy, we get uh, freedom uh, from relapse at 10 years in the 50%. And these are patients that were not properly staged. So many of them probably were more advanced stage. We also use the uh, larger field. So it's hard to compare uh, exactly, but we know these patients are potentially uh, curable and we have to have the definition of uh, cure. Some of these patients are young and this was particularly effective with the data from Stanford in young uh, uh, patients. So we know we can do it uh, with radiation and help, help uh, a large number of patients. But more important was to know that we can do it in the modern era with the small fields using a staging uh, with PET. And this is the work, the, the work of uh, ILROG uh, that uh, uh, was led by Jessica Brady, George, and, uh, and Rich Hoppy, and uh, 500, uh, over 500 patients using the more uh, commonly used the doses of radiation therapy in early stage patients. You can see that uh, uh, the vast majority of patients are achieving a good uh, uh, disease control, long uh, uh, survival without disease. Of course, stage two, a little bit than uh, stage uh, uh, one. So this benef clear benefit from radiation therapy, mostly here in uh, small uh, fields, led the NCCN uh, guidelines with all the previous experience to recommend that for stage one, 
uh, or contiguous stage two, which is most of, most of the stage two, uh, uh, they involve site radiation therapy, a small field is the preferred treatment. Uh, and one would expect that this will be uh, followed, especially in by the NCCN uh, institutions. And the doses that was recommend that are recommended in the guidelines, uh, this is the uh, 2021 edition, is 24 to 30 uh, gray for these uh, diseases. Uh, there are other options that are listed here, and if you sit in the NCCN guideline committee, you know that it's uh, like United Nations, you get to have some kind of a consensus and everyone wants his treatment to be uh, recognized, and there is even room here for observation. However, uh, the observation, uh, the NCCN guidelines tell us, may be appropriate in circumstances where potential toxicity of ISRT, which is a small field, uh, or systemic therapy outweighs the potential clinical benefit. So it's really rare, and uh, this, uh, and uh, but you will see in a minute that uh, uh, many of the patients in the United States in the NCCN guidelines, based on the, this lymphocare uh, study, is of course a selective submission of patients. But you will see that radiation therapy to early stage is given in only to about a less than quarter of the patients. And uh, another large group of patients are observed and other are getting uh, a chemotherapy with rituximab or rituximab uh, alone. What are the reasons for that? I don't want to speculate uh, uh, now, but the, uh, certainly we see if we look at the National Cancer Database of 36,000 patients in early stage follicular lymphoma, and you will see there, there is a significant decrease in uh, over the years of patients who are treated with radiation therapy and increase with observation and increase uh, with uh, chemotherapy. So uh, if you look at that, is it right or wrong? And uh, we uh, had a very uh, detailed uh, study that Joanna Yang has done when she was uh, at uh, at Memorial together with the Harvard School of Public Health and our uh, and our epidemiologists and statisticians. And this is to, to look at patients that were uh, building a model, a Markov model modified, and to see what is the expected uh, survival of patients who start their career with radiation therapy for early stage, uh, what is happening if you start with rituximab, and what is this observation, and I think it's very clear that uh, radiation therapy, according to this model, had a significant advantage. And not only, uh, only that, if you look at what are the years gained with a quality adjusted life expectancy, you'll see that the most are gained is if you start in early stage with radiation therapy and you solve it with R-TROP. Uh, however, if you are starting with R-TROP or Vendamastin, uh, the number of years are uh, reduced based again on this data for national, uh, for the uh, large database. Not only that, it is significantly uh, cheaper, less expensive if you start with radiation therapy. Actually, to be correct, if you start with rituximab, uh, you, it, it is a, a little less expensive, but you lose four years according to this uh, uh, mo uh, model. Uh, if you start with uh, uh, rituximab and bendamastin or with r -chop, you are talking about $2 million of treatment because it is less successful, more salvage, more intervention, and more uh, toxicity, again, according to this model for early stage. Uh, so let's uh, talk uh, uh, about uh, the dose and what, uh, what we can do uh, to uh, uh, reduce any toxicity. And here is the famous study by the uh, British who randomized study comparing 36, the standard dose at that time to 45 gray with 24 gray. And we're looking at the freedom from local progression. There is no difference. And this is how 24 gray became the standard dose for early, for early stage. At the same time, and from France, from Institute uh, Gustave Roussy, the French were pioneers, actually many things in radiation of, uh, of lymphoma, including ISRT, mostly Theo uh, Zhirinsky. And, uh, uh, and this is the first paper, 1994, talking about their experience with what they called boom boom. Uh, and we use this name a lot, so uh, perhaps it influenced one of the famous uh, winemakers, uh, in Washington state to have this label of uh, what they describe as a very good wine. Uh, the 
Other data came from multiple studies in Europe showing that using a boom boom or a two by two uh, and uh, achieving a CR gives you uh, uh, very good re uh, results in terms of, in terms of uh, local uh, control and freedom from uh, progression uh, locally. Yet we have the famous uh, four study that everyone uh, uh, knows that uh, compared again by the British uh, group, uh, uh, the same group uh, that did the uh, first study, uh, 24 gray to this new uh, four gray. And this was uh, done in 600, uh, over 100 patients. And then uh, recently updated in Lancet Oncology. The first update was uh, a few years ago and it has really not uh, changed. And what uh, we have here, these patients were patients with relapse advanced stage multiply treated, but there were also uh, a, a smaller group of patients where a patient then they were treated upfront. So uh, what we see is a, a difference between the patients that have were treated with the standard dose to those with uh, only uh, four uh, gray. It had a non-inferiority design, uh, similar to what we are going to, uh, uh, to suggest uh, uh, la later. And, and you see that only 70% only of the patients uh, had a disease control that is a, uh, uh, pretty long with four gray. So you can look at it in, two di in, a, in different ways. You can go with the uh, study conclusion that 24 gray is standard dose, I agree, uh, and should be uh, used for uh, patients, especially that are uh, potentially curable. And then that uh, the uh, low dose may be good for uh, patients who need uh, palliation uh, uh, and uh, so forth. So these were the conclusion of, this, of, of the study. But we and we we get a lot of questions about uh, uh, about patients uh, that are potentially curable, marginal zone, uh, and uh, and patients with uh, uh, with a, a palliative uh, situation or early situation. Okay. To, Good, hurry up. To be uh, treated okay, with only like boom so There's a lot of discussion here. and controversy on that, uh, and we thought that we can look at it in two different ways. Uh, first, I remind you, 70% is not a small number. You're given a radiation that is hardly any uh, radiation uh, that may be affecting uh, uh, more the environment and have uh, an immune effect and just killing every uh, cell around. And you can tell early on if these patients will, uh, uh, will relapse or, or not. Uh, and you may be able to change that and correct it and use adaptive uh, uh, therapy. So uh, uh, we have here, we see here an opportunity and, and uh, we can say, well, 30% uh, of the empty glass approach, we are not getting the best that we can. On the other hand, we can say, well, the glass is 70% full and four gray is clearly enough for many, many uh, patients and we perhaps should do more with less. And that uh, lends, uh, uh, leads us to what we call the adapt adaptive uh, approach. Uh, and, uh, and the adaptive approach is what we were uh, offering to uh, some of our patients over the last uh, uh, 20 years. Uh, and I will uh, show you some, share with you some of the results and the proposal uh, for a study. When we look at our results and we have uh, uh, carefully followed uh, and prospectively monitored uh, patients uh, with, uh, uh, with follicular lymphoma early stage and marginal zone lymphoma, uh, uh, so with uh, 300 sites, we see that if we use only four gray, uh, we get similar results to the, to the fourth, but we also see that some subgroups, especially the marginal zone lymphoma, are doing pretty well with only, uh, with only four gray. Uh, the other important uh, observation is that has, there is no difference in overall survival. If you look at the two groups after, uh, I think, uh, uh, very reasonable follow-up. And the group that is receiving the low dose does not uh, uh, require more subsequent systemic therapy or, uh, or even uh, local th therapy, 
uh, if they fail in a, in, a in a distant site, then the group that has received the full dose. So this is sort of encouraging. So the, the policy that we developed uh, over the years uh, for, for patients, and obviously there is a selection bias here, is that for early fo uh, stage follicular lymphoma, we have a discussion of the standard treatment 24 or the option to go with four gray. And if the patient selects the low dose option, we mandate evaluation between eight to 12 weeks by PET or clinical exam if it's a, a skin. And then according to the results, if there is a complete response, we continue with observation. If there is a partial response, we, we wait three to six months and repeat the imaging and uh, then consider either adding more low dose, another four gray uh, or eight gray or uh, going with uh, the standard disease and uh, the standard dose. And if it's a, a stable disease, we uh, will again have this consideration uh, however, if there is local progression, we will uh, add uh, more radiation to the, the full dose or consider a systemic uh, therapy. So with this algorithm, we lived pretty, uh, pretty well, but of course there is the selection bias and these, and we have the concern of our colleagues who said, well, yeah, you tell us that you can cure this patient. I want him to get the full dose, not that uh, 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 boom boom that you uh, you tell us is ver working very well. So uh, in our uh, large series of uh, 250 pa patients uh, that we had uh, uh, inclusion uh, uh, criteria that we will have a uh, grade one to three A local localized disease uh, and will all be biopsy uh, confirmed and we did not include lesions that were completely excited with, uh, without residual measure, measurable disease. And what important I think in the analysis, and I will not present the full analysis that, uh, uh, that Brandon and others uh, uh, have, uh, have done, we'll do it another time because it's a very important and interesting information coming from this uh, uh, large uh, experience. But we looked at the potentially curable patients that are newly diagnosed, that are stage one and two, and no history of any lymphoma-directed therapy. And then we looked at the non-curable intent, the patients that uh, uh, were advanced or, uh, or uh, relapsed and came and received the boom-boom therapy. So and the study endpoint that uh, we analyzed is uh, the incidence of local progression use, using competing uh, risk of death, uh, and as a secondary uh, endpoints, the best clinical and radiographic uh, uh, response early on between uh, until six months uh, following uh, uh, the low dose radiation, distant progression of disease outside the field, overall progression of disease, a combination of both, obviously overall survival and the time to subsequent therapy, any therapy. And of course, we were very interested uh, to, to see as Gilles suggested, this is a serious uh, uh, event, not very common. Is there a histologic transformation uh, to diffuse large B cell lymphoma uh, for patients that were treated with low dose non-standard uh, radiation therapy? So if we look at the group that we call definitive or the potentially curable, we had 46 of those. And interestingly, we have achieved in 80% of the patients a complete, re a complete response in 15 percent of the patients a partial response. Some of it is a very good partial response. So a total of 95% uh, response uh, to patients with stable disease as no patients with progression uh, of, uh, of disease. I uh, <clears throat> will not uh, go into the other uh, uh, large number of uh, patients that were not with the curative intent. When we analyzed the data, there were no difference, and this is the multivariate analysis between the patients that uh, had uh, uh, <coughs> potentially uh, curable uh, intent and uh, the patients that were in the palliative uh, uh, treatment. And we saw that very clearly the size here matters and over uh, six centimeter, we have an adverse effect in the total group on uh, uh, on uh, the outcome of uh, uh, of a, a local uh, uh, local progression, 
And that is also seen in uh, some other st uh, studies. So we can say size uh, matters, it remains the most consistent, uh, consistent pre predictor for again, for uh, both uh, groups. So if we look at the, what happened in terms of the need for additional treatment with, ver with very low uh, dose, and we can see that here at the bottom are the patients that are potentially curable. And we can see there were very, very few ev events in, in, in this group. And I mentioned the numbers they were doing uh, uh, very, uh, very well. Uh, so uh, uh, the uh, salvage, uh, what that was needed was really, uh, really uh, minimal. So that uh, was quite exciting. The patients are very happy to see some of the medical oncologists that see the patients back are surprised uh, with, uh, with the results. Uh, uh, some uh, of them are in uh, critical uh, locations. And I will add that in the COVID era, we introduced instead of boom, boom, the big boom, one dose of 400 and for patients that uh, fear coming to the hospital or coming from far away, uh, it has been a very good approach. And so far, the results are similar. So uh, if we can move to the your study, because we are at one hour, 37 minutes. So uh, we're going to start losing people. Uh, OK, well, uh, let me just continue uh, with that. We are in, at, the, at the study. Uh, you can see that we have not seen a transformation in this group. Actually, in the potentially curable patients, there was not a single event of transformation. Uh, so uh, this is the rationale for the study that I am uh, about uh, to propose. It's actually a study that was uh, uh, devel developed uh, by uh, my two younger colleagues, uh, Dana, who is now at uh, the University of North Carolina, and Brandon I I Imber, who is uh, with us. And here is uh, the study that, Butena, you asked me to go into. And here is a prospective randomized study one of the first, uh, maybe, or first few of that ILROG is conducting, uh, perhaps the first. And what we are going to randomize is the adaptive approach versus the standard approach. And on the standard arm, for patients with stage one follicular and marginal zone lymphoma, that we will stratify follicular versus marginal zone, stage one versus two, we will uh, go with the standard dose versus a very low dose radiation therapy of only four gray in two, in two fractions. And these patients that will get the experimental dose will have a 12 week PET evaluation. If they are in CR, they will get no additional radiation therapy. If they'll get a, have a PR, we will wait another six months to reevaluate because most of the PR in our experience either get into CR or become stable. And only if there is a, a, a minimal response or a stabilization or progression of disease, we will add then the 20 gray in uh, 10 fractions. Needless to say, the patients on the standard arm uh, will get no additional radiation therapy. And the primary outcome will be progression-free survival at two years, secondary outcome local failure, distant failure, overall survival, time to systemic therapy, rate and of transformation to end toxicity. So here at the end point, I men mentioned them, uh, the progression-free survival primary at two years, but we continue to follow the patients much, much longer. Radiographic response at, uh, uh, by the RISIL criteria, local progression. I mentioned all of that, I will not uh, repeat. The exploratory endpoints are quality of life and financial toxicity. I think this is important. Nowadays, CT DNA, immune parameters and genomic correlatives uh, will be taken during that study. Here are, this is important, the inclusion criteria. Patients must be diagnosed with follicular lymphoma or marginal zone lymphoma, only grade one, two, must have stage one or two. Patients should be newly diagnosed or previously observed with no prior lymphoma directed therapy, age over 18, and must be able to start the radiation therapy within two months after the time of randomization. The exclusion criteria are the grade three A or B, we decided to take it out, prior radiation to the site needing therapy, patients plan to receive 
concurrent systemic therapy for the lymphoma and a gross resection of the disease. Mold lymphoma of the stomach we are not including. Tumor size must be equal or less than six centimeter based on the data I mentioned. And also please note the patients with cutaneous uh, only disease, we will go with the low dose. Uh, we had excellent results with them. And this is actually the suggestion of uh, Gilles Sal. And they will be uh, treated on a prospective registry, registry study for low dose, but will not be randomized. So many people were concerned here. Ilrog is undertaking a prospective Actually, before you go study. into this, I think uh, Dr. Sal needs to leave to a meeting. So uh, I would let him uh, leave. And if Dr. Nassip will also need to go, uh, she can. Uh, the rest of you can stay with us so we can further discuss the study and see if there is an appetite for, for it to be uh, uh, around the world. Uh, Dr. Sal, would you like to say something before you leave? Thank you so much for giving us uh, your uh, time and effort. Sorry, we went overboard and I'm sure you have other commitments. Well, so, sorry to interrupt, Aki, but uh, uh, I would like I'm to say... With that. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Uh, thank you for this fruitful discussion. Thanks to you also for this fruitful discussion regarding this project that I will really strongly support, as I mentioned in the chat. And I look forward to continue to interact for those of you that I know and uh, those that I uh, discover in the near future. Thank you again and uh, wish you all the best for the end of the meeting. Sorry having to leave in, in one minute. No problem. Thank you so much. Dr. Nassipul, I think she already left because she has also other commitments. Uh, okay. Ahi. Yeah, so this uh, discussion in the next uh, only two slides to go, I think really is mostly for our community, for the radiation therapies that I believe will uh, participate. Uh, so the design is a non-inferiority design, and we're always concerned will we be able to accrue the number of patients that we need. And the answer is at least I believe that we will accrue and it will accrue quickly. So we all that we need with this uh, uh, design, which is a non-inferiority design, according to two groups of statistician is 355 patients using the assumption that the baseline two year progression free survival is approximately 80% based on the studies I showed you for those who received 24 gray in 12 fractions. We allow for the non-inferiority margin of 10 years, that's pretty standard, and which would be two years local progression, must be more than 70% in, in the experimental arm, so it will be non-inferior, with 80% power and an alpha of 5% and 10% drop, dropout. I think that this is not an impossible number to have. So, and the situation for this uh, study that already get the enthusiasm support in our uh, in our center and, uh, uh, and uh, including uh, Gilles uh, South who is uh, leading the medical oncologist. Uh, it will be done under the ILROG umbrella uh, in the ILROG office with the research coordinator uh, Beatrice uh, who organized also uh, this webinar uh, uh, and uh, it will, be, it will first be open at the MSK. We are moving quickly forward with Brandon Imber as the PI and in the University of North Carolina with Dana Casey, who helped a lot in the, in the design and the concept of the study. And we have already had a sort of a, a, a commitment and, or a strong interest to participate. And they were part of all the early discussion. Uh, Dana Farber, Princess Margaret, Washington University in St. Louis with Joanna, University of Minnesota with Stephanie in Rochester. I don't know, uh, Butena, I hope uh, your group will enjoy, you said you will. And we got a, a, a strong request from, uh, from Tata Cancer Center. It is an excellent center in Mumbai that they would join. We are looking forward to hear what the UK IROG uh, group uh, will discuss. I know that George is bringing it from discussion and I also in communication with our Intel, Italian uh, colleagues to see if they will have interest uh, to use, uh, to do a, a phase three study. So this is uh, where we are and I hope you will all, uh, all uh, join us. You will get the protocol. We will do a lot of the uh, technical work that is necessary for the 
uh, all the agreements that are required with ILROG or with MSK, we see what's the best legal thing. And uh, if you have any question, I'll be happy to address. So, so Aki, Sandy, you, so you'll be sending, if we're interested in joining you, you'll be sending us all the materials? Yes, of course. Okay, Hans, did you have a question? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> no problem. All right. Uh, I, I'm sure that it's at one hour 47 minutes and many of you have many other commitments to go to. Uh, again, I'm sorry about the confusion about the time zone, but uh, as I said, uh, Beatrice is recording this and she would post it. Uh, we wanted to end with uh, the study as a preparation for next webinars where we will be sharing our research because uh, we want to educate during the webinar, but we also want to share with our colleagues around the world what kind of uh, collaborative research we can run together. Uh, so that would be uh, at least a forum through the webinar to share with you uh, the new development that could also uh, strike or uh, initiate uh, a collaborative work. Uh, if if you have any questions, please uh, either raise your hand, put it in the chat. I will be ready to answer it. Tim, did you have a comment? Yeah. I wonder uh, by show of hands, I have some of the pictures here. How many people will consider participating in the first prospective randomized study that IROG will have on, a, on a those questions? So we have 78 and only like 30 of them, they have their video on. I'm not sure that it's going to be a fair. Yeah. Oh, you can show okay. your hands on the Yeah, so I can, your I, I, I can see those that I see pictures and I see that the majority are interested on, in participating. I think it would be a, a really, uh, if we will be able to show that this is equivalent, a benefit for our patients, and it will convince our medical oncologists not to go with observation and rituximab and a $2 million treatment for early stage, but to use a treatment that costs nothing, that has no toxicity. And if we are not achieving the CR, which is in the minority of the patient, we can quickly correct it in the right time based on adaptive, uh, the adaptive approach. So I encourage you all to join. We'll finish it quickly and we'll, uh, uh, will have a, a very, very important uh, study uh, for the whole group. All right. With that, we're going to end uh, this webinar. Thank you so much for joining us and hope that in the next one, we will have more uh, contribution and we'll have an active and live discussion among all of us uh, because I think the next webinar is not going to be in a format of a lecture. It will be more in a format of sharing our uh, research and research ideas. So stay, stay tuned. It's coming very soon. Thank you so much and have a great day and a great evening to those of you who, who uh, signed in very late.